You ever wake up and think to yourself, what's James Cameron doing these days? Apparently, he's in production on four sequels to Avatar. These were announced in 2013, and the first was supposed to open in 2016. They've been delayed repeatedly, and finally began production last year, with the first one now scheduled for a 2020 release. These days, James Cameron is less known for his filmmaking than for being a guy who spends all his time at the bottom of the ocean and won't shut up about 3D blue aliens. So with all of this, and the fact that he only makes one movie every 12 years or so, it's easy to forget that James Cameron is a really, really good filmmaker. This is obviously a series about action scenes and action movies, and I'm going to make a big sweeping declaration here. James Cameron might be the best action filmmaker of all time. Flame special, aren't you, son? So I got dressed and grabbed all the James Cameron movies and... Matt. Matt. What's up? Do you know where the Blu-rays for The Abyss and True Lies are? No. Wait, never mind. Turns out they haven't been released yet. Okay. So this means that if I use any footage from The Abyss or True Lies in this video, it'll have to be in... <sighs> standard definition. James Cameron has only made seven movies, but those seven include the two biggest films of all time and some of the most famous action movies ever made. Even his movies that wouldn't generally be put in that genre still rely heavily on action storytelling. Like, yeah. Titanic is a big romantic drama, but the last hour of that movie is all action. Compared to other legendary action directors, Cameron's approach isn't as distinctive. He doesn't have the style of John Woo, the innovation of the Wachowskis, the deranged inventiveness of George Miller, or the choreography of any great martial arts film. But Cameron has never been interested in fancy stylistic flourishes. As huge and expensive as his movies are, his action scenes aren't excessive or indulgent. The storytelling is clear and focused. His goal isn't to be cool, it's to be exciting. And he does that by being as direct as possible. Look, James Cameron is not a subtle filmmaker. Like, did you know Avatar is about the environment? And that Aliens is about being a mother? But you know what? Subtlety is overrated. At least when it comes to movies like this. These movies call for someone who paints in big, bold strokes. And that starts with the characters. James Cameron makes character-driven movies, and right away, he makes damn sure you understand who these characters are. Like I said, he's not subtle. Not my mother, Todd. Good morning, Dr. Silverman. How's the knee? Pandora will shit you out dead with zero warning. I go to a man! <laughs> but in each case, you understand them right away. You know who they are and what they want. And it's this focus on the characters that makes his action scenes so memorable. The first lesson we can learn from Cameron is to keep the stakes high and the odds stacked against the characters. The James Cameron recipe for action is pretty much this. Establish characters we care about, then pit them against impossible odds. In every Cameron action scene, the protagonists are totally outmatched. This is not Captain America versus some random goons you know he can destroy without breaking a sweat. This is ordinary humans versus an unstoppable murder robot. Or a kid versus a more advanced unstoppable murder robot are ordinary humans versus a whole hive of xenomorphs. When we watch a lot of modern action scenes, we think, man, I can't wait to watch the hero kick some ass. But in Cameron's action scenes, we think, how the hell are they gonna survive this? Each action scene is a desperate fight for survival, and the danger escalates constantly. Anytime the heroes gain an inch, there is immediately a reversal and the odds turn back against them. In Terminator 2, the heroes get to the elevator, but the T-1000 forces the doors open. They shoot it, but it climbs on top of the elevator and cuts Sarah. They get to the parking garage, but it runs after them. They get to a car, but it grabs onto the back and smashes in the rear windshield with its sword arms. In Aliens, if one Marine manages to shoot an alien, then its acid blood sprays on them and burns them, and they accidentally light their vehicle on fire with their flamethrower. In the great Every Frame of Painting video about action comedy, they point out that part of what makes Jackie Chan's action scenes great is that he's always the underdog. And the same thing goes for Cameron's action scenes. The heroes don't win, they just survive. 
This might sound like a crazy concept, but action scenes are usually more exciting when it feels like the characters are in actual danger. Which leads us to the second lesson. About a year and a half ago, I made this video about how many of the best action blockbusters have horror elements in their set pieces. And Cameron is a perfect example of that. Aliens is obviously a sequel to Alien, one of the best horror movies ever made, and the Terminator movies are pretty much slasher movies with car chases. These action scenes are told largely through the visual language of horror movies. Unseen creatures emerging from the darkness, people hiding, cowering in fear. Cameron's action scenes are motivated by the same things that motivate horror set pieces. Unstoppable forces trying to kill the characters. That's what the last hour of Titanic is. Cameron understands the visceral power of fear and horror, and he uses it to make his action scenes more exciting. But for that horror to be effective, for us to really feel the tension, we have to empathize with the people in them. In the action scenes, Cameron keeps the focus squarely on the characters. And whether they're grizzled space marines or suburban kids, they react believably. They get scared, they panic, and they get hurt. We see them struggle. A lot of modern action scenes are frantic, the motion doesn't stop and the action beats happen so fast that we don't really feel them. But Cameron takes the time to emphasize every beat. Every gunshot has an impact. Every hit causes a reaction. Every action moves the scene forward. We care because we see how everything affects the characters, and because we see the impact in their reactions, the danger feels greater. In the last hour of Titanic, Cameron treats Jack and Rose's desperate struggle to stay alive with the same care that he did their love story in the previous two hours. With the huge scale and massive visual effects, it would be easy for the characters to get lost amidst the spectacle, but they always remain the focus. Die Hard is often brought up as one of the very best action movies ever made. We all agree on that. But Die Hard doesn't have the coolest shootouts or the best car chases or the craziest special effects. It's great because all the action moves the story forward, and it's always focused on John McClane's efforts to survive in the face of impossible odds. The action feels personal, and that's why we care about it. It's the same exact thing that Cameron does in his action. Considering how hugely expensive his movies get, and how full of groundbreaking visual effects they are, it's amazing how intimate the action scenes are, how he never loses sight of the personal stakes. I want to compare these to the biggest, most popular action movies being made these days, the Marvel movies. Now look, I enjoy these movies a lot, I think they're a ton of fun, and in general, their action is cleanly shot and enjoyable and full of good character moments. But when it shifts into those action set pieces, which are full of impossible CG camera moves and animated characters bouncing and crashing through the frame with superhuman grace and slickness, as fun as it is, we don't really feel it. Iron Man getting smashed through a building feels harmless compared to the T-800 getting hit in the head with a steel beam. But this isn't just a CGI versus practical effects thing. Making an action scene with a lot of CG elements doesn't mean it has to feel weightless and impersonal. So now I'm going to say positive things about the film Avatar. So the whole big climactic battle scene in Avatar is like 80% CGI, obviously with performance capture used for a lot of the characters. It would be easy for us to disengage from what's happening since it's almost all created in a computer. But the choice Cameron makes that is so important is to shoot it exactly like it were regular live action. A common thing you'll see with mostly CG action scenes are these shots where the camera flies through space in a way that would be impossible in live action. And things like this subconsciously indicate to us the artificial nature of what we're watching. But in Avatar, the camera always behaves like a real physical one. It doesn't do anything a real camera couldn't do. It's often handheld or recreating what would normally be helicopter or car-mounted shots. There's a real weight to the computer-generated elements. The dragon things shift around in flight imperfectly. You can feel the wind rushing by. While Marvel's action scenes tend to shift into an animated world that we know isn't real, where the characters bounce around and move with a speed and precision that no person ever could, Cameron manages to keep this whole sequence of giant blue people on dragons fighting helicopters grounded. It feels tactile, even though almost none of it is. Look at this quick moment. We get this wide shot that lasts for seven seconds that lays out the geography of the scene, shown from the perspective of the Na'vi attacking from above. Then it cuts to a close-up of the main character, getting back to that intimate character focus Cameron is so good at. Then in a few handheld shots, we see the dragon thing land on one of the helicopters and grab it. We can feel the weight of these things. We see on his face the effort and difficulty it takes to throw the thing down to the ground. 
Even when it's an almost totally CG scene, Cameron sticks to the same principles of action storytelling that he's had through all his films. One thing that becomes apparent when you look at all of Cameron's action scenes is how they pretty much never end in the same place where they begin. Cameron is never content to simply have two people stay in one place and fight. The action scenes evolve and mutate as they go, moving through multiple locations with different kinds of action. A shootout in a hallway turns into a fight, then a foot chase, then a motorcycle chase. A scene begins at a motel, then becomes a car chase, then it ends at a factory. A shootout at an office building turns into a helicopter chase, then a truck chase, and then ends at a factory. Look, there are only so many places where you can kill a Terminator. This scene in True Lies starts as a fight in a bathroom, then becomes a shootout, then a foot chase, then a motorcycle versus horse chase through streets, buildings, elevators, and rooftops. Cameron's action scenes have stakes, tension, emotion, and inventive staging, but this would all mean nothing if they weren't told with clarity. And this is where Cameron really shines. If you've seen any episodes of the series before, you know I care a lot about geography, because in action, it is essential. And Cameron always makes sure the geography is absolutely clear. We always know where every character is in relation to each other. We always understand the geography of the location. The key thing Cameron does is keep the spatial directions consistent. In this scene in Terminator 2, the action is constantly moving left to right. That's the direction Sarah and John Connor are running to the elevator, and that's the direction the T-1000 pursues them in. In every shot, the action is moving in the same direction. When they get out of the elevator, again, the action is moving left to right. Even when the T-1000 and the main characters aren't in the same shot, they're framed facing each other, so we understand where they are. He's running left to right, Sarah is shooting right to left. Then, when they spin the car around, the action switches, going right to left. That's the direction the car drives, that's the direction the T-1000 runs. The final battle in Avatar is hugely complex, with action happening simultaneously in the air and on the ground, with a ton of characters. This could easily get chaotic, but Cameron orients us by, at all times, keeping the bad guys facing right and the good guys facing left. No matter where in the battle we are at any given time, we always understand what's happening just from how the characters are framed. The conflict is constantly visualized just from how the characters are facing. Look, I know we all love people like Alfonso Cuaron with their fancy extended takes doing a whole action scene in a single shot. They are hugely impressive and immersive, and I always enjoy watching them, but they are also a little bit distracting. When you're watching them, you're thinking about what the camera is doing. And Cameron isn't interested in that. He wants you to not think about the camera at all. He's telling the story as clearly as he can, so you always know what's going on, and you're engaged with the story, not how it's being told. So the fundamental elements to Cameron's action scenes seem obvious. Keep the odds stacked against the characters, make them struggle, keep the focus on their reactions and emotions, have the action evolve and change, and make sure the audience always knows exactly what is happening. Now, these aren't big secrets. You don't have to look very hard to discover them. But it's amazing how few action movies seem to be aware of them. It's why so many action scenes just kind of wash over us, fading from memory. But we still remember this. And this. And this. There's a saying coined by music critic Tom Brayen, originally used in an article about Taylor Swift. Respect mother craft when you hear it. In other words, even if it's slick commercial pop music, recognize good songwriting. And if you swap one word around, the same thing goes for filmmaking. Yes, James Cameron makes hugely expensive blockbuster movies that have all the subtlety of, well, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he's telling stories that engage us, that make their intentions clear and deliver on them that create characters we care about, and yeah, the whole point of this video, action scenes that thrill us. And that's all built on great storytelling and masterful filmmaking craft. It's not easy to make a massive blockbuster movie with thousands of moving parts and cutting edge visual effects that still has an emotional impact on millions of people, but he makes it look easy. So when it comes to James Cameron, respect mother craft when you see it. The thing you have to remember about James Cameron is that he knows something the rest of us don't. He's only made seven films and yet has transformed cinema. Back to back, he made the two biggest movies of all time, and they weren't even sequels or adaptations. He doesn't make successful movies, he makes iconic movies. Movies that become cultural phenomenons. Phenomena? 
I'm not saying all this to prove that James Cameron is good at making money. I'm saying it to demonstrate that above all, his talent is in telling stories that connect with an extremely wide audience. It's easy to dismiss him because he apparently wants to spend the next 20 years making movies about blue aliens that no one seems very excited for, but remember, James Cameron knows what he's doing. Every time people have bet against him, they've been proven wrong. And at the core of his abilities is that he understands action storytelling better than just about anyone alive today. So let him make as many weird blue alien movies as he wants. He's earned it. But also, James, since you love blue things so much, uh, when are we going to get those Blu-rays for The Abyss and True Lies? Just wondering. So today's video is brought to you by Cheddar, not the cheese, the news company who recently launched their YouTube channel. They have videos covering business, technology, media, and news, but without the boring parts. And look, as someone who makes video essays, I am very picky about what video essays I watch. And these ones are genuinely good. Yesterday, since I was sick and not in the mood for getting off of the couch or moving at all, I sat here and I binged a bunch of their videos. Some of my favorites were the ad campaign that saved Old Spice, how hipsters saved PBR, and the real reason for New York Skyline Gap. These were all videos that explored questions I didn't even know that I wanted answered. So I recommend going over to their channel and watching a bunch of their videos, and hey, maybe even consider subscribing. Welcome back, guys, and thank you so much for watching. So usual ending stuff. Check out the Patreon if you want to help us keep making these videos. Follow me on all the social medias. It's at Patrick H. Willems everywhere. And listen to our podcast. If you like these videos, you'll probably like that as well. Links are in the description below. And I'll be back here in, like, two weeks with new video. Stay tuned.